Happy trails to you. It's great to say hello and to share with you the trail we've come to know. It started on the day that we met Jesus. He came into our hearts and then he freed us for a life that's true. A happy trail to you. Well, there we go. Greetings, everyone, and those of you who join us by Facebook. And we're going to be in our Bible this morning, if you will, to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We'll spend our time this morning, invest our time this morning in a study of the, the problem of the lost. Uh, title of the message today, The Problem of the Lost. As I mentioned before, over the next uh, several weeks, over the next few months, I want to be uh, reviewing and building and establishing uh, us in uh, certain things that were, so we can really be settled in certain things as we come toward the end of the year. Uh, and so I, I want to address this question of the problem of the lost. And so you're in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and read the entire chapter uh, for context purposes, and then we're going to zero in on verses uh, 3, 4, 5, 6 down through there. So we're in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry. And so as you open up chapter 4, of course, it's a reference back to what Paul has said and chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3. So he's laid some things out in those, in those chapters. And so he gets to chapter 4 and he says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry. I think I've preached a message on us having a ministry, a specific ministry. And so he says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by the manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. <coughs> So then death worketh in us, but life in you. We, having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken, we also believe, and therefore speak, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus, and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God, for which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Of course, he goes on from there. So let's zero back in to verses 3 through 6. I'll read those again, and we'll begin uh, taking this message and, 
and dissecting and presenting the answer or the question, the problem of the law. <coughs> he says in verse 3, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. And the Bible speaks a whole lot about lost and folks that are lost. Jesus talked about the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Uh, and then Paul, Paul talks about us being lost or, or us, you know, people that are without Christ and being lost. And so as if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. It goes on, verse 4, in whom the God of this world, and we've, we've been in this passage recently, and so we're not giving you anything new as we read through here, in whom the God of this world, we know who the God of this world is, Satan himself, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. We preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So as we read through here, we know that he says the gospel's hid. It's hid to them that are lost. And it says then the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. And so as we present the title and, and go on with the message, the problem of the lost, well, the problem of the lost we find right there in verse 4 is that they believe not. What is their problem? They don't believe, or they find themselves in unbelief. If you were to take uh, one of your Bible apps or a good concordance and look up the word belief or believe, or look up the word unbelief or believe not, and as you follow that thing down through there, I mean all the way through the Scripture, uh, the problem with mankind and their relationship with God uh, for the lost has always been that they simply did not believe God or refuse to believe God. And so he says, The God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. So the problem of the lost man is simply that he does not what? Believe. He doesn't believe. He doesn't believe the gospel. And so uh, that's always been the problem. Look with me in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We've got another reference that talks about this. Go with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We believe, I, I believe, and I teach that, uh, uh, that this dispensation of the grace of God will come to an end. Uh, it will, the end of the dispensation of the grace of God will be signified by the catching away commonly referred to as the rapture of the church, the body of Christ. So we're living in that dispensation of the grace of God. Uh, I believe that uh, it's, I, don't, I don't necessarily hold to the idea that when the last individual is saved, like there's a certain number of people that Jesus knows is going to be saved by the grace of God, and when that number is complete that the rapture takes place, I tend to lean towards the idea that when the church, when the when the Gentiles uh, were in the dispensation of the grace of God, uh, Paul said in Acts 28 that the that the uh, the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles and they will hear it. Uh, Romans 11 talks about the Gentiles being cut off. Uh, I'm one that tends to believe that the end of the dispensation of the grace of God is, is less about the last one being saved into the body of Christ and much more about us reaching a place where the Gentiles are in the same place of unbelief that Israel was back there in the first century. And why was Israel cut off? Because of unbelief. Romans 11 tells us that they were cut off because of unbelief. And the warning is that the Gentiles could also be cut off because of unbelief. And so the gospel of the grace of God that's preached primarily to Gentiles, received by, primarily by Gentiles, and preached and spread primarily by Gentiles, when the Gentiles reached that same place of unbelief that the Jews were in in the first century, when God set them aside, and saved Saul of Tarsus and gave him that body of truth for the church, the body of Christ. Y'all, Some of y'all follow me where I'm at. Uh, when the Gentiles reached that same place, 
than the opportunity to be saved simply by grace through faith in the finished work of Christ, that opportunity will be over and it's signified by the catching away of the church, the body of Christ. Okay? And so uh, when you're in 2 Thessalonians, that's the context of what Paul's talking about. And uh, so we just kind of read down through here. Begin at verse 1 of 2 Thessalonians 2. Again, we're talking about the problem of the lost and the problem being unbelief. So he says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, begin at verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. Now that's talking about the rapture of the church, right? Okay? That ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Apparently somebody had forged a letter and claimed it was from Paul telling them that this thing was right there. He goes on, verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, uh, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So that's a reference to uh, the church is caught up, and then after that, the day of Christ commences, and in that day of Christ, the day of God, the day of God's wrath, the day of God's judgment, the day of the Lord, all those references. We did a study on the day of Christ, the day of the Lord, all those things here. Uh, I'm sure it's out there on, on our YouTube channel. But uh, but then we know that when the church is raptured out, then God resumes his prophetic dealings with Israel. Uh, as you read through your Bible, you're back there to the early days of Acts as the gospel of the kingdom is being preached to Israel as they're preparing to go through the tribulation. You're right back there when the church is caught up as far as God's prophetic dealings with the world and in resuming his dealings with the nation of Israel. And we know that over that course of time that there will be a one world leader that uh, is referred to as in verse, in, uh, verse uh, 3 here uh, as the man of sin and the son of perdition. Uh, John refers to this man as the Antichrist. And so we all are aware of those terms, the tribulation, the 70th week of Daniel, the time of Jacob's trouble. And uh, this prophetic time, when uh, that's a seven-year period of time, that's why it's called the 70th week of Daniel, uh, when the Antichrist will rise, there will be a one-world government and a one-world religion and a one-world monetary system, all those things. And so that's the reference to what's going on here. And so he says then in verse 5 as we continue reading, <laughs> Remember ye not that when I was yet with you I told you these things. And now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. So even in Paul's day, he said this mystery of iniquity doth already work. And then he goes on and says, He who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Now we, again, we've been through this passage many times. The word let here in our King James Bible is, we would, it's, it's an old word that we, that we say, but it's not used very often. I always give the illustration that even in modern usage, it's used the same way. I'm not a tennis player. I don't know anything about tennis. But in, the, in, in those that play tennis, when the ball hits the net and is hindered, it doesn't go over the net like it's supposed to, but it hits the net, it's snagged, snagged up in the net somewhere, somehow, uh, whatever they call them in tennis. I don't know if they're referees or umpires or, or, or what they're judges. I have no idea what they call them. But that one who's calling the game and watching the game there uh, cries out, let! And the idea is the ball was hindered by the net. Something happened. And so as we read through there, verse 7 again, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And so there's, a, there's one who's letting or one who's hindering the rise of the Antichrist and the rise of the Antichrist, that mystery of iniquity that's already at work, that thing's hindered until, 
Uh, this one who's doing the hindering, the letting, is taken out of the way. And I've taught you before, and I believe that the he there in verse 7 is the church, the body of Christ. Paul calls us in Ephesians the one new man. And so he who now letteth will let will be taken out of the way. And so when the church, the body of Christ, the one new man is taken out of the way, we're raptured out of the earth, then that man of sin is revealed. So we have that. Again, in our church life, we've been taught that the he there is the Holy Spirit. But I contend with you that uh, uh, while, the, while certainly we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God today, uh, just because the church is raptured out, caught up, that doesn't mean the Holy Spirit leaps. Uh, the Holy Spirit was poured out in that upper room on the day of Pentecost to those Jewish believers and they were baptized with the Holy Ghost. In other words, the Holy Ghost had a ministry during that time of the early Acts. And when the church is caught up to be with the Lord, uh, the Holy Ghost then picks right up, like I said earlier, with what was going on in the early Acts. The Holy Ghost picks right up with that ministry that he has of baptizing those folks who believe with the Holy Ghost. And so the Holy Ghost doesn't leave. So what I say to you there at verse 7, while many have taught that the He is the Holy Ghost, uh, the Holy Spirit, uh, I don't believe the Holy Spirit departs. Uh, his role just reverts back to what it was in the early Acts according to prophecy. All right, continuing on. He says, And then shall that wicked be revealed. So when he who now letteth will let is taken out of the way, then shall that wicked, capital W, be revealed, that's the Antichrist. That's the man of sin of verse 3. That's the son of perdition of verse 3. And so he says, And then shall that wicked be revealed, who the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So again, there's a whole lot of stuff in those few verses. Then when the church is caught up, God resumes his prophetic dealings with the nation of Israel. The man of sin is revealed. The Antichrist runs to power. All those things that take place. But does he stay in power? Well, the answer to that is no. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Uh, we know that at the second coming of Christ, uh, that uh, Satan and his the angels of Satan, the fallen angels, are, are bound and put into the lake of fire. And we know that Satan is bound and put into the bottomless pit for a thousand years. Everybody with me? I'm just like, I know I'm covering a lot of stuff without taking all the references, but uh, these are things that we should have an understanding of. And so where it says in verse 8, Then shall that wicked be revealed, so the Antichrist comes to power, but he says that Antichrist who is revealed, he goes on then and finishes verse 8, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, the second coming of Christ to the earth to establish the kingdom. So at the second coming, you read all about it in Revelation. Of course, the Old Testament prophets talk about it. Uh, and so you find that there. All right, now verse 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. And so this wicked, this man of sin, this son of perdition, uh, who rises to power after the church, the body of Christ, is caught up. This wicked, this man of sin, this son of perdition, whom the Lord will destroy with the spirit of his mouth, the, that sword of the spirit of his mouth that is coming uh, at the end of the tribulation. But that man says, verse 9, it says, His coming is after the working of Satan, and he has all power and signs and lying wonders. And so when the Antichrist comes to uh, rule and, and reign and he comes to his place of power, he's going to come with miraculous, supernatural, what's it say there? Power, signs, and what kind of wonders? Lying wonders. We often say that Satan is a counterfeiter, isn't he? He's a counterfeiter. So he mimics things that God does. Well, we'll not spend a lot more time there. But it goes on now, verse 10. And here's where we're trying to get 10, 11, 12. And with all deceivableness, deceivableness, that's a 
tongue tangling word, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because why? They receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Verse 11, And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned. Verse 12, Who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And so it's a reference there that, that when the anti, you know, after the church is caught up, God resumes his prophetic dealings with Israel. That prophetic time clock starts again. Uh, that wicked, the son of perdition, the man of sin, uh, uh, Satan himself, one who comes with all the power and signs and lying wonders and deceivableness of Satan, that one who comes to rule and reign during that period of time, that seven years, as referred to the tribulation, it says there that uh, verse 10, uh, that in them that perish because, why? They receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. He goes on down there in verse 12, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And so when we talk about the tribulation coming, who is it that's going to be uh, fall into the category of verse 10 and verse 12. The unsaved. the unsaved, the lost. Those who in this dispensation of the grace of God heard the gospel of Christ, heard the gospel of the grace of God, knew the truth that Christ died for their sins, was buried and raised again for their justification, but they believed not, right? Then they're left behind Y'all know that series, right? Left Behind. It's a good phrase. There's, there's a lot of bad doctrine in the series, okay? So me mentioning the series is not an endorsement of the series, the TV series, the movie series. A lot of bad doctrine in there that's not quite correct. But the idea of those that are left behind, well, they're left behind and they will be deceived by all this stuff that the Antichrist is able to do and the reason why is because, verse 12, they believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So again, what is the problem for the lost? What is the problem of the lost? First and foremost, and above all everything else, it's the matter of unbelief. We need to make sure that we got that. When we're dealing with lost people, whether they're religious lost people, and are there religious lost people? There's lots of religious lost people. What makes a lost person, a, a religious lost person, why are they lost? It's because they're not believing and trusting the gospel. It's because they're trusting in what they're doing. Right? Okay, so it's still a matter of unbelief. All right, we'll pick up that a little bit more as we carry on. The problem is that they believe not. So now, back to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and, and uh, we'll carry on here. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I'm going to ask the question here. Why do the lost, why do they believe not? Well, the answer is in verse 4 again, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So they're, they believe not, and why, do they, why is it that they believe not? Because they've been blinded. They're blinded. They can't see. Uh, 2 Thessalonians said they received not the love of the truth. So they, they were blinded. Who blinded them? The God of this world blinded them. Now, again, the purpose of bringing the message, the problem of the lost, and trying to present this stuff is, is that, again, as we go out into our life as the ambassadors of Christ, and as we're seeking to be a witness and seeking to present the gospel of Christ, preach the gospel of Christ, reach the lost with the gospel of Christ, uh, we ought to have a great compassion and a great concern for those folks because the condition they find themselves in is because of the God of this world has blinded them. 
Why are they lost? Whether they're, and, and, and when we talk about that, again, you know, so many times we think about the lost, we think about the, the, the wicked, down and out, filthy, dirty, rotten sinners, you know, the druggies and the whoremongers and the, you know, all the stuff that we think about with that stuff. Um, but again, as we go out in this world, it's, it's not just those who find themselves in the depths of sinful depravity uh, as we think of it and make those lists, but it's you know the religious as well who are lost. Um, but whether they're religious and lost or whether they're just pagan and lost, the condition is the same and we should have a heart of compassion and a heart of concern and, and approach in that manner and have that frame of mind as we reach out to the lost because it's the God of this world who's blinded them. So we look at that. Alright, so he says that plainly there. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Turn your page back uh, one page if, if that's where it is in your Bible or just look across the page. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, Paul's talking about, uh, toward the end of the chapter there, he's talking about Israel and them having a veil, and even when Moses is read, they have a veil. And so he gets down there at verse 14, and I'm abbreviating for time's sake, he gets down there at verse 14, and he talks about... Uh, uh, talking again about Israel and Moses being read and them having that veil... He says in verse 14, But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. And so he's basically saying, even did Moses prophesy about the coming of Christ? Yes, he did. Moses prophesied about the coming of Christ. But, he, but do Jews back in the first century, those who rejected Jesus of Nazareth as the Christ, when they read Moses, did they see Jesus there? No. They did not see that Jesus of Nazareth was fulfilling all those Old Testament prophecies concerning the coming Christ, their coming Savior. They had a veil. They did not see it. Even today, when we're talking about Jews and and. and we're talking about Jews by religion. There's a whole lot of Jews by heritage, Jews by bloodline, who are simply that. Uh, I, I have a great deal of Native American blood in me. I'm Native, of Native American heritage. I don't practice the Native American religions, right? And so as a Native American, I have that culture. I don't practice that religion. Well, there's lots of Jews out there that have that bloodline, have that heritage, but they don't necessarily practice the Jewish religion. Uh, but whether they're atheist Jews or whether they're, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, uh, I don't want to say it's compliant, but they're observant. That's the word I'm looking for. Or they're observant Jews. When they read the Old Testament prophets, is there still a veil on their face? Can they, they, they just... They read it, but they don't see that Jesus of Nazareth fulfilled all those things. Are, are those Jews right there in Israel today, are they looking for a first coming Christ or a second coming Christ? They're looking for a first coming Christ. And so that's where he comes back right there again in verse 14. But their minds were blinded. Their minds were blinded for until this day. That was true when Paul wrote 2 Corinthians, and it's still true today. For until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, and that veil, which veil is done away in Christ. And so when he says that the God of this world hath blinded their minds, then we know that Israel's mind was blinded to the truth of the gospel. And again, who did that? Satan, the God of this world. Look with, me, look with me to your right in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. We'll just pick up at verse uh, 17, 18. 
This I say, therefore, and testify in the word Ephesians 4, verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other what? Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. Notice verse 18, having, their under, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the what? Blindness, Blindness of their heart. And so Paul writing to these Ephesians believers and he's saying and he's describing those Gentiles who have their understanding darkened or alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that's in them because of the blindness of their heart. And so when he says the, in, a, in a, a 2 Corinthians 4, 3, the God of this world hath blinded the minds lest they should believe the gospel of Christ, uh, we know then that the Jews' eyes are blinded. They can't see that Jesus was indeed the Christ. And as the Christ, he died on the cross for their sins, was buried, and raised again for the justification. And the Gentiles also have been blinded, their understanding darkened, walking in the vanity of their mind, alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them. They're blinded. And so we know again that uh, when we talk about believe, and why is it that they don't believe, it's because they've been blinded. Now there's two things that, uh, and I'm sure there's lots of things, uh, if we were going to make a list, and any time a preacher says something like this, he's just waiting for somebody to come out and say, well, Brother Sam, you said there was two things, but I can tell you three things or five things or six things. Well, if you can, that's wonderful. Go preach that message, okay? <laughs> but I'm going to mention to you today that, that I'm going to point out two things that blind us. And... Uh, one thing that blinds us is light. When you were a little kid, you'd look up at the sky during a pretty day. What would your mom and daddy tell you? Don't look at the what? The sun. Don't look at the sun because it'll do what? Blind you. It'll blind you. We all, I mean, I'd say all of us grew up with mom and daddy, grandma and grandpa telling us, don't look at the sun, it'll blind you. Have you ever been around somebody who welds? All right, so welders, they wear that welding mask, and it's got that really heavy glass and several layers of glass. And why do they do that? Because you look right at it, it'll do what? Make you go blind. It'll blind you. <laughs> and so they tell you, never, you know, never look directly at, at where somebody's welding because the light will blind you. So we know it's the God of this world that blinds. We know that it's the lost who believe not, who've been blinded, and so there's two things that can blind. One of those things is light, the wrong kind of light, and then another thing that blinds, of course, is darkness. If there's absolutely no light at all, so too much light, or the wrong kind of light, or darkness, no light at all. How many of y'all have ever gone to any of these caves and caverns around the Smokies? You ever done that? You go into those caves and caverns, I think they do it at uh, Tuckaleechee Caverns over in Townsend. I think they do it at the uh, Forgotten or Forbidden Forbid. Cavern over here, uh, you know, towards Sevier County over here uh, between Newport and Sevierville. And you go down in there and you get to that bottom and what do they do? They're going to cut off all those lights. And buddy, when you in that hole in the ground and covered up, they turn out all the lights and you can't see your hand in front of your face. Isn't that pretty amazing? So two things blind, the wrong kind of light and then the absence of light altogether, darkness. All right, go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. What is it Satan uses to blind? He uses light and then he uses darkness. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And you're familiar with these places, I know. But we get to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and again, for time's sake, I always want to walk into it and start at the beginning and walk down in there, but for time's sake, we won't. We're just going to pick up at verse 13, 14, 15. We're talking about why do the lost believe not? Because they're blind is one of those reasons. And uh, they've been blinded. Both Israel and the Gentiles have been blinded. So the things that Satan used to blind, one is 
like. So we go to verse 13, 14, 15 of 2 Corinthians 11. He says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Now think about that. There are those out there who are what kind of apostles? False. What kind of workers are they? Deceitful. They're transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. In other words, they're standing up, presenting as though, what's the word apostle mean? It means sent one, right? And so they're standing up and they're presenting themselves as sent ones, apostles of Christ himself. He says these that are doing so are false apostles, deceitful workers. Now verse 14. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into a what? An angel of what? Light. Light. So the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest they should believe and receive and come to the of salvation through the gospel of Christ. And so what does he use to blind folks? He uses this light. He presents himself and he transforms himself into an angel of light. Verse 15, Therefore it's no great thing if his ministers be trans also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose ends shall be according to their works. Now again, you look down through this verse and we've got apostles, we've got workers, We've got apostles of Christ. We've got angels of light. We've got ministers of righteousness. Well, that sounds like the local church staff, doesn't it? You with me? Yeah. But in here, as he's talking about this, these apostles, these workers, these who present themselves as the apostles of Christ, these who would say that they are angels of light, these who are ministers and profess to be ministers of righteousness, yet the scripture is telling us here that they're not true, but they're false apostles. They're deceitful workers. It's Satan himself who's transformed into this angel of light. How many times have we said that Satan is most busy behind pulpits on Sunday mornings? He's presenting himself as an angel of light. Well, you say, Brother Sam, Satan is only one created being. He can't be everywhere at once. So, you know, there's no way Satan can be in every pulpit across all the country. You know, I mean, he can't be in every pulpit in Cobb County, much less uh, in the state of Tennessee or the United States or around the world. Well, that's certainly true. That's why it says in verse 15, Therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness. See, the God of this world hath blinded the minds of those who believe not, and he uses, quote unquote, light to blind them. All the religions out there of the world, all the denominations out there in churchianity, uh, we start talking about what are they preaching for salvation? What's being taught for salvation? Again, my dad was a card-carrying Bureau of Indian Affairs, uh, you know, Cherokee medicine man. Sweat lodge in the backyard, all that stuff. My dad was glad that I got off drugs and quit stealing, but at one point my dad said, Son, you have forsaken your native culture and followed the white man's religion. My dad's gospel was if you believe, if you lived right and you did good and, and overcame and made up for, you know, my dad would say he made a lot of mistakes in his youth, but he made up for those things and overcame those things as an old man. And my dad died without Christ. My dad died a lost man but he believed he was walking in what? Light. He believed he was walking in light. Where did the light my daddy believed he was walking in come from? Satan. Satan. 
the God of this world. And while my dad believed he was walking in light, yet actually he was walking in that deceivable light from false apostles and deceitful workers who had transformed themselves into ministers of righteousness. To add insult to injury as I would try to be a witness to my dad and try to share the gospel with my, with my dad, uh, he had a real struggle with me not accepting him as on his way to heaven or the happy hunting ground or whatever you want to call it, uh, he had a real problem with me not accepting that. And, and one of the reasons he had that problem is because my dad got invited to speak at lots of churches. Lots of churches would have my dad come and speak. And he would go and he would talk about, you know, Indian things. And he would go and talk about, you know, living a good life and he would go and talk about you know being a better person and all that kind of stuff and the gospel that he was preaching was not a whole lot different than the gospel that that church was preaching because what gospel was that if you do enough good you get to go to heaven now, isn't that what is preached in most religions out there and that religion, that light, quote unquote, has blinded these folks. And who's the author of that light? Satan. Satan himself. So it's important to see that. All right. Goes on then. Uh, we said light blinds and darkness blinds. Go with me back to Ephesians. Go with me back to Ephesians again. Go to Ephesians chapter 5. Pick up at verse 3. We'll read down through uh, verse 12. Ephesians chapter 5. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become the saints, nor filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, nor uh, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them, for ye were sometimes, what's the next word? darkness. And so while 2 Corinthians chapter 11 talked to us about uh, while 2 Corinthians chapter 11 talked to us about uh, uh, the light uh, as it relates to Satan's, the angels of Satan and the ministers of Satan being transformed to the angels of light. So while 2 Corinthians talked to us about religion bringing light, which is part of the tool that God that this God of this world uses to blindness. We find also as we read down through verses 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 down through there that these are all appetites of the flesh that lead us seems like into darkness. He says again verse 8, for ye were sometime uh, many years, ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Now, of course, that's the light of the gospel that it talks about in uh, where we were in 2 Corinthians 4. It goes on, but for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. He says in verse 11, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, for it's a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. Isn't it true that a whole lot of the things, and I don't know, y'all may have been really good all your life, but I'm going to tell you about mine as a kid and when I was getting in so much trouble. You know when I got most of my trouble? What time of day do you suppose it might have been? After dark. After dark. 
we're raising our kids, our teenagers, you know, we realize, you know, hey, listen, there's not, I mean, there's a certain hour that there's just not going to be a whole lot of good things come out of all that, right? Darkness. So he talks about the darkness. Look across the page, Ephesians chapter 6. Just drop in there at uh, verse 12. And we were here. We talked about this a few weeks ago. But verse 12, we rest, uh, Ephesians 6. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. So once again, we're going to stop and take our break here for a minute. But once again... When we talk about uh, the problem of the lost, the problem of the lost is that the God of this world has blinded them. And what does the God of this world use to blind the lost? He uses too much light, the wrong kind of light, right? In the, and I'm going to say the religions of the world that present themselves as light. And he also uses the darkness of this world. And so whether it's the wicked, depravity, depths of sin, or whether it's the efforts at pulling ourselves up by our own bootstraps, either way, these are two things that the world, that the Satan uses, the God of this world uses to blind us. Think about it like this. When you're dealing with a religious person, isn't it very difficult to bring them to a place to, so they see that their religion won't save them? I mean, that's a tough thing to bring them to a place where their religion won't save them. Why? Because the God of this world has blinded them because he's presented himself as a minister of righteousness. And then when you're dealing with that person that is depraved and in the depths of depravities of the appetites of this flesh and this old God-forsaken sinless world and they end all that, when you try to reach someone like that, how many times have we heard this thing or, or folks, start, if they don't say it, they think this thing in themselves is, I am too wicked, I am too sinful for God to save me. You ever heard that one? I'm beyond the help of God. I'm beyond the mercy of God. But, now, do you think that Satan would use those two things to blind folks? Light of religion and the darkness of this world. God of this world has blinded folks. We're going to stop there because we've we got to give answers, right? So we'll, we'll take our break, take about 15 minutes, and we'll come back and we'll finish the message. Thank you. Yes, sir. Happy trails to you until we meet again. Happy trails to you. Keep smiling until then. Who cares about the clouds when we're together? Just sing a song and bring the sunny weather. Happy trails to you till we meet.